Hey, good evening, everyone. It's so good to be with you tonight. I have been so excited about this time of ministry and coming to be a part of uh, your service and being able to share the word of God via live stream and technology. Thank God for this technology. But I wanna say a big um, thank you to your pastors, Pastor John and Sherry. Oh, how I love them so much. They've become such dear and precious uh, friends, such a blessing to my life. So I wanna say, um, thank you to uh, your pastors for giving me this opportunity to come and be a part of your service and share the word of God with you this evening. You know, with all of the unusual events that are taking place in our world right now, people are beginning to talk about Bible prophecy and end time events once again. And I have always loved Bible prophecy. My dad has taught and preached Bible prophecy for more than 50 years. And it's so exciting for me to see happening right before my eyes right now, uh, the things that I have heard him preach for 50 years all my life to, to see some of these things taking place right now. That's, that's very exciting to me, but I realize while that's exciting uh, for me to see all these events, uh, events happening, I realize that there are other people who are um, somewhat fearful, many are very fearful about some of the events that are taking place in the world right now. Uh, a lot of them are fearful, uh, even believers, because they do not have a good, solid, proper biblical foundation and understanding of scripture when it comes to end time events and Bible prophecy. And so it, it's my hope and it's my goal by um, this teaching tonight um, that it will just uh, present a very basic teaching uh, to help people come to a better biblical understanding of what all these events mean and what is coming and what is uh, going to be next on God's uh, prophetic timetable. So I want to just go over some of the major events on God's uh, prophetic calendar, his prophetic timetable. And I want to do it in chronological order because there seems to be um, just so much confusion, uh, lack of good teaching um, on end time events. And so uh, I want everyone to just have a clear understanding. So I just, I want to go over some major uh, events that are mentioned in scripture. I want to go in uh, chronological order. And so just touching on the main events, they are the rapture of the church, the tribulation period, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the lamb, the second coming of Christ back to planet earth, the uh, battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign of Christ, when we will rule and reign on planet earth with Jesus for a thousand years and the new heavens and the new earth. And I, I wanna go through this timeline again because I want us to have a real clear understanding of where we are and what is coming next, I believe. Uh, the next major prophetic event will be the rapture of the church, the tribulation. While the tribulation is taking place on planet Earth for seven years, we who are the raptured saints will be raptured and we will be in heaven while the tribulation is going on on the Earth for seven years. We will be in heaven with the present in the presence of of Jesus with the Lord for those seven years. And while we are in heaven, there are two events that will take place for the raptured saints. The first is the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the lamb. And at the conclusion 
of the tribulation, at the end of tribulation, at the end of the marriage supper of the Lamb, we as the bride of Christ, the wife of Christ, will then return with Jesus back to planet Earth. And he will come again, the second coming of Christ to planet Earth. And we will come with him to fight the battle of Armageddon. The millennial reign of Christ will follow after that when the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered every enemy during the battle of Armageddon. And he has dealt with the Antichrist and the false prophet. We will literally rule and reign after the battle of Armageddon. We will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ from the city of Jerusalem during the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And then after that, one more time, God will deal with the devil once and for all, and he will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And then the new heavens and the new earth will be uh, created. Heaven will come down to earth and we will live with Jesus in his presence forever and ever. So that is just a real quick um, a timeline of events that are coming. And so tonight I want to look at just a couple, uh, for time's sake, we can't hit all of them, but tonight I want to look at the rapture very quickly, uh, the tribulation. If we have another time to share like this, I'll talk more about the tribulation. Uh, but tonight I wanna focus on the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So tonight, if you'll do me a favor and just maybe grab pen and paper, um, get ready to jot down a few notes this evening as we uh, go along in this study. And there are two passages of scriptures that I would like for you to jot down real quickly, if you will. And they are Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 20. One That is Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21. In both of these accounts, the disciples are asking Jesus, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming? When will these things take place? What, what will be the sign? What, we sh what should we be looking for? And in both of those combined passages, Jesus lists um, the signs of his coming. And he says to his disciples that there will be deception and there will be wars and rumors of war. And he says, kingdom will uh, rise against kingdom and, and nation will rise against nation. And that word nation actually comes from the word ethnos, which uh, we get the word ethnic from. And he goes on to say that there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famine. There will be pestilence. There will be fearful sights, great signs from heaven. He says there will be persecution. There will be betrayal and even martyrdom. He goes on to say there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. There will be distress of nations. The sea and waves will roar and men's hearts will fail them for fear as they see what is coming upon the world. But Luke 21 verse 27 goes on to say, Jesus says, when you see these things taking place, then everyone will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So when you see these things begin to happen, Jesus says, look up, and lift up your heads and know this, your redemption draweth nigh. And so in the last uh, several years, there has definitely been an increase in the signs of the times. Uh, but within just the last four, four and a half months of 2020, um, we have seen 
the prophetic signs uh, increase in almost a shocking way. Things are changing day by day and just within the last few months, prophetic events are happening at a truly accelerated pace. And so I want to tell you tonight, clearly, uh, I believe that Jesus is coming and I believe that he is coming very, very soon. I don't believe he is coming soon just because of the most recent events, just because of COVID-19, just because of a uh, so-called worldwide pandemic. Uh, I don't believe Jesus is coming soon just because there is talk of forced vaccines that may be upon the horizon for everyone or uh, the digital currency, the digital ID that everyone is talking about right now, the tracking system um, that will track everyone, their movements, their coming and their going for everyone in the world. That technology, it, it's already available. It's already out there. Um, that certainly, all these things will certainly be um, a part of uh, the system of the beast, the system of the Antichrist. Those things are unfolding right now, taking place. Uh, the stage is being set for the system of the Antichrist. But when I say that I believe Jesus is coming very soon, it's not because of these most, uh, these most recent events. I believe that Jesus is coming very, very soon because one of the super signs that uh, this generation has seen take place concerning the nation of Israel. I, I would call it a super sign, if you would allow me to say it that way. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaks about the parable of the fig tree. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. For when its branches bud and its leaves began to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know that summer is near even at the door. I tell you the truth. These are the words of Jesus. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass away until all of these things take place and all of these things are fulfilled. Bible scholars agree that the fig tree represents national Israel. And in 1948, a major prophetic event was fulfilled when Israel became a nation once again, basically a nation born in a day. It fulfilled Bible prophecy that was foretold hundreds of years before. Uh, prophecy was fulfilled when millions of people began returning back to their homeland, returning back to Israel. And Jesus said, this generation, this generation shall not pass away. I believe he was referring to the generation that sees Israel become a nation. And the Bible speaks of a generation being 70 to 80 years. So if we do the math, and I am not setting dates, I am not setting dates. This is only uh, an observation, uh, something to think about. But 80 years from the year of 1948, when Israel became a nation, that would put us around the year of 2028. And so many of the signs that I mentioned earlier, um, they are happening. There's no doubt about it. We cannot deny what is happening. But so many of those signs that are being fulfilled, they are pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there are a couple of events that, as I understand Bible prophecy, that must precede or come before the second coming of Christ. And that is the rapture of the church and the tribulation period. 
So if we look at all the signs that are taking place and we go, my goodness, we're so close to the second coming, but yet the tribulation and the rapture must take place before the second coming, then how much closer are we to the rapture of the church? If we're that close to the second coming, how much closer are we to the rapture? Because there's no prophecy that I can find. There's nothing in scripture that has to be fulfilled before Jesus can come and rapture his church. And so it truly could happen at any moment, at any time. And I, I just I just want to say this. I, I'm going to take a little detour here and, and, and just say this. Um, please be very cautious uh, when you hear uh, preachers who do not uh, preach on the imminent soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I heard a well-known minister uh, recently say just a few days ago on Facebook, he uh, had a uh, Facebook post where he said uh, to all you Christians who are talking about the coming of the Lord. He said, I promise you, it is not going to happen this year. And I promise you, it will not even happen in the next five years. Well, what I say to that kind of mentality is this, no man knows the day or the hour, only the Father in, in heaven. And I believe that the Bible teaches a spiritual principle found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. I believe that scripture uh, teaches a spiritual principle on the importance of living prepared, living in a prepared state, always ready to meet the Lord. And so I want to take just a minute right here to uh, talk about something that I believe has caused a little bit of confusion among uh, some believers regarding in time events and Bible prophecy. And that is the difference in the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. Because they are not the same. They are two completely different events uh, for example, let me just draw some parallels here uh, as we read in Scripture, as I understand Bible prophecy and um, uh, the majority of preachers and scholars, and I'm certainly not a Bible scholar, but as I interpret, um, there are many that interpret the word uh, the same way as I, uh, but as I interpret Scripture, um, I, I believe that the Bible tells us this, uh, that there will be a pre-tribulation um, uh, rapture of the church, a pre-tribulation rapture. That means before tribulation happens, we will be raptured out. So let me just show you some parallels between the rapture and the second coming. In the rapture, the rapture will take place before the tribulation. The second coming, it will take place at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Concerning the rapture, the scripture says no one knows the day or the hour. At the second coming of Christ, Jesus said, when you see these signs, you will know that the end is near. At the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, we will come back to earth. In the rapture, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. The Lord will not come all the way back to planet. We will meet him in the air. But at the second coming, we will come back to earth with Jesus, and he will physically put his feet down on the Mount of Olives in the city of Jerusalem. At the rapture, the scripture tells us that he will come as a thief in the night, to the unbelievers. At the second coming, scripture tells us that the whole world will see him when he comes at that time. At the rapture, he will come for his saints. At the second coming, he will come back with 
his saints. Hallelujah. I love that. And so while there are many signs that are pointing to his return and the second coming, Jesus makes it clear that the rapture of the church will happen suddenly and will take place without warning. Matthew 24 says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They were just doing life until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the son of man be. These are the words of Jesus. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. For you do not know the hour that your Lord is coming. There are some people that believe the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation. There are others who believe that the rapture will take place at the end of tribulation. But as I have studied scripture, I believe that this Bible is very clear in what it teaches. And I believe that the Bible teaches a pre tribulation rapture. Again, that means Jesus will come and rapture us, the church, the true believers out of this world before the trouble and tribulation period begins. And the apostle Paul says it this way, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up. The word there is raptured to meet the Lord in the air. And then he goes on to say, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The tribulation, my friends, will be a period like the world has never seen before. The Bible makes that clear. It will be the most horrific time that there ever that there has ever been in human history. There will be no comfort in telling people that they are going to have to go through the tribulation. Paul says, comfort one another with these words. There is no comfort. When we tell they're going to have to endure all the things that the book of Revelation describes, all the things that's going to take, but it will be horrific, the things that will happen during the tribulation. There is no comfort in that. Also, in the first three chapters of Revelation, the church is mentioned 17 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. But the church is not mentioned again until the 19th chapter, when we return to earth with Christ at the end of the tribulation period. So why is the church not mentioned in chapters 4 through chapters 18? I believe the church is not mentioned in those chapters because we are going to be in heaven with Jesus during that time while the earth is experiencing those seven years of tribulation. So during the tribulation, God is literally going to pour out his wrath upon the wicked. But First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says this, that God has not appointed us unto wrath. God has not appointed us unto wrath. So for those of us who are rapture ready, we don't have to live in fear of the Antichrist. We don't have to live in fear of the mark of the beast and the things that are going to happen during the tribulation time. Because as I read and interpret scripture, and there are many, many, many that will agree with me, we don't have to worry about those things because we will not be here during that time. However, St. Paul did write this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
Paul wrote that concerning his generation. If that was true for his generation, how much more it is now in our generation, because that's what we are seeing right now happening in the streets of America. Even though the Antichrist and the man of sin and, and the person, the Antichrist, has not been fully revealed, the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of lawlessness is at work in the world today. But Paul goes on to say this, that the Antichrist, the man of sin, cannot be revealed until the one who is restraining him is taken out of the way. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the scripture bears this out. I believe the restrainer that Paul is speaking about here, I believe the restrainer is the power of the Holy Spirit operating through the church of Jesus Christ. So the Antichrist cannot step on the scene until the church of Jesus Christ is removed from the earth and raptured out of the earth. So what's next on God's prophetic timetable? What's next on God's prophetic calendar, many would ask. I believe with all of my heart, the next major prophetic event will be the rapture of the church of the living God. So when people try and tell you, because right now there are so many conspiracy theories and everyone has an opinion, when people begin to try and convince you, well, we are living in the tribulation period right now, you can tell them with certainty. The tribulation is a time when God will pour out his wrath upon the wicked. But 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9 promises that God has not appointed us to wrath, but unto salvation. And so with everything that's taking place in the world right now, that's good news for believers. Amen. That's good news. So while I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, I also want to be quick to add this. That does not exempt us from trouble. We will experience trouble, I believe, before the rapture of the church. You know, right now, there are some things that are happening that I thought would not happen until after the rapture, when the Antichrist was on the earth ruling. I never dreamed that churches in America would be shut down and be forced to close their doors, but it's happening. It's happening right before our very eyes. So again, let me say, I believe we are going to have need of endurance to persevere even before the coming, uh, even before the rapture, we're going to uh, need to persevere and endure before the rapture. We're going to see trouble. We're going to go through trials. But when God gets ready to pour out his wrath on the wicked during the tribulation, make no mistake, I believe scripture bears this out. We will be gone. And again, that's good news. In fact, that is the glorious hope of the church. That is the glorious hope of the church. The rapture is the glorious hope of the church. So what's the next event after the rapture takes place? After the church is raptured, the tribulation period will begin. The tribulation period will last uh, for seven years. The last three and a half years of that seven year period is called the Great Tribulation because the events will intensify during that time uh, in the last part of uh, the tribulation, during the time known as the Great Tribulation. Uh, for a period, Satan will be cast down to earth. Uh, there will be no church to restrain uh, it will be a time like the world has never seen before, and God's judgment will also uh, be poured out upon the wicked, the rebellious, uh, upon the Antichrist, and upon the false prophet. 
and it will be a time like this world has never seen before. In fact, Jesus said concerning this time that we should pray that we are worthy, that we are counted worthy to escape what is coming. I believe that is a reference to the rapture. We should pray that we are worthy to uh, go in the rapture, that we're worthy to escape the tribulation period. But while the world is experiencing a almost literal hell on earth, those of us who have been raptured will spend those seven years in heaven with Jesus while the tribulation is taking place on earth. Those, for those seven years while tribulation is happening on the earth, we will be in heaven in the presence of the Lord for those seven years. And while we are in heaven during those seven years with the presence of the Lord, there are two events that will take place in heaven during that time period. Uh, the first event is the judgment seat of Christ and the second event, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, you know, we, we don't hear a lot about uh, these, uh, these two events. Uh, so I want to talk about them real quickly uh, this evening for just a few moments. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ is also... Um, called the Bema Seat. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ will be for raptured believers, those who made the rapture. It will be, this judgment will be for the raptured saints. Romans 14 uh, says this, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of ourselves before God. This judgment, though, understand, this judgment will not be to determine our salvation that has already been settled, that has already been decided. The judgment seat of Christ is where God will judge believers for our works that we did while we were on the earth. God will judge believers for our works, and he will reward us accordingly. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says this, We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what we deserve for the good or evil that we have done in this earthly body. So the judgment seat of Christ is where our works will be weighed, where we will give an account uh, for our actions our talents, the time, the money that God entrusted us with, our, our attitudes, our motivation, the intent of our heart um, while we were on the earth. First Corinthians 3 says this, On the day of judgment, the fire will test each one's work. If anyone's work endures, he will receive a reward. But if his work is burned up, he will suffer great loss. So the judgment seat will also be a place of reward. Yes, our works will be weighed. God will judge the intent of our heart, the motivation, what we did for him on earth. But the judgment seat will also be a place of reward. Revelation 22 and 12 says, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. This is Jesus speaking. I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to repay every man according to his deeds. And the Bible mentions some of those rewards as being crowns. And there are five different crowns mentioned in scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about the incorruptible crown, also known as the victor's crown, that will be given to those who have run their race and finished well. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the crown of rejoicing, also known as the soul winner's crown. This crown will be given to soul winners. And I don't believe it will just be a crown that is given to soul winners, but I believe this crown will be given to those who um, gave sacrificially, those that financed the work of God. So evangelists like myself could, could go uh, and win the loss so that missionaries could go abroad and preach the good news. And so I, I, I believe that, um, that there will be some that never went to foreign lands or, 
or uh, never answered the call to stand uh, in a public pulpit, but because they financed the work of the ministry, I, I believe that they will uh, quite possibly receive um, the soul winner's crown as well. Uh, thirdly, then there's the crown of life, also known as the martyr's crown. Uh, James chapter one, Revelation chapter two uh, speaks of this. And this crown will be given, according to those scriptures, this crown will be given to those who have endured temptation. It will be given to those who have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ, even to the point, to the point of death. Um, fourthly, the crown of glory is mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 4, the crown of glory, also known as uh, the elder's crown, which will be given to pastors and ministers who have been found faithful um, as they stand before the Lord. And lastly, the Bible mentions the crown of righteousness. And this crown is simply given to those who love his appearing, those that are looking, those that love his appearing, the crown of righteousness will be given to them on that day. And in Revelation 3, Jesus said, I am coming soon, so hold fast to what you have so that no man takes your crown. That tells us that there will be some that may have spent their entire life perhaps working for God. But at the end, it's quite possible that they will lose their heavenly reward because we know that in this last day that the enemy is working overtime and he is doing his best to cause shipwreck of our faith, to get our eyes off of the prize and to try and take our crown and try to take our heavenly eternal reward. So like never before, let me just admonish you tonight, like never before, we must be determined in this hour to be faithful to the end. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, this is a beautiful promise from God's word. It tells us that whoever gives a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord will not lose his reward. There will be a reward for that individual. You know what? Basically, that tells us anything that is done for Christ and for the glory of Christ with the right motivation, with the right attitude, no matter how big or small it may be, the Lord is telling us that that deed will receive a heavenly reward. And so I think about what a uh, great tragedy it would be to stand before the Lord on that day and have no crown to lay at his feet, no reward because we lived for ourselves rather than for the king and his good pleasure and his glory. I think about how sad and how tragic it would be on that day to receive no reward because we did nothing or little with the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the time, the money, that God invested, uh, our, uh, invested to us. Or maybe we did a lot of good deeds, but we did it for the applause of man and we did it with the wrong motivation. Scripture makes it clear that those people will receive nothing from the Lord. But I want us to see something else. Not only does a crown represent the reward that we are going to receive from our labors while we're here on earth as we serve the Lord. But I believe the crown also represents two things, position and authority. And let me explain this to you. At the end of the tribulation, we are going to enter a period called the millennial kingdom. And during that time, the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Christ for a period of a thousand years, and we will literally rule and reign with him on planet earth from the city of Jerusalem. And I want to mention this, I want to mention this real quickly. In Matthew uh, 25, Jesus spoke through a parable saying this, that if we are faithful over little, he will make us ruler over much. And so I believe, and we don't hear this taught a lot, but personally, I believe according to our faithfulness here on earth that we will be rewarded 
not only with a crown, but with positions of authority to rule and reign and to govern throughout the earth with Jesus during that millennial reign. Some may rule over cities, some may rule over nations, we do not know. But I do believe that um, according to our deeds while we were on the earth, that part of our reward will be positions of authority, different levels of authority to rule and reign with Jesus Christ um, during the millennial reign for 1,000 years. So what we do for Christ right now, it really does matter for all eternity. So let me just say this again. Since the judgment seat of Christ is for believers, it's important to remember this. We are not saved by our good works. We are saved by grace, but we will be rewarded according to our works. Let me say that again. We are not saved by good works. We are saved by grace, but we will be rewarded according to our works. So after the church has been raptured and after the judgment seat of Christ, what's next? Well, I believe what comes next is this. We will be with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 describes this. And there are so many beautiful scriptures in the word of God that liken the coming of the Lord to a wedding, to a wedding feast, to a wedding event. So I, I want to look at, I want to close with this tonight, but I want to, I want to talk about uh, real briefly the marriage supper of the Lamb by giving you just a little bit of, of Jewish tradition and Jewish history. Uh, Jewish tradition tells us that when a young man decided to take a bride and choose a bride for himself, it was actually the father that would initiate that engagement. And so the father and the son would go to the bride's house and the father of the groom would negotiate with the father of the bride because there was a price that the groom would need to pay uh, for his bride. And I love what scripture says here. It just dovetails into Jewish um, tradition so perfectly and so beautifully. First Peter 1.18 says, we were not redeemed with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ Jesus. What a price he paid. But once they had negotiated the terms of that marriage contract, then they would enter into the marriage covenant. And the marriage covenant would not be consummated until a later time, but it was at that time a legal binding covenant between the two. So once the covenant was made, the couple was, would seal the covenant by drinking of a common cup, by drinking of the cup together. And I want you to see this. The scripture says that Jesus came with a new and better covenant. And before he went to the cross to pay the price to redeem mankind from our sin and to bring us back into right relationship with him, into a covenant relationship with him, I want you to notice what happened. The Bible says the night of his betrayal, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Do you know when he is going to drink of that cup again? He's going to drink of that cup again at the marriage supper of the lamb with those who have been raptured, the bride of Christ. So while Jesus celebrated the feast of Passover with his disciples, he was actually foretelling his own death and resurrection as the perfect Passover lamb, which fulfilled the law of Moses. 
but also prophetically speaking, he was looking down the road 3,000 years later when we will drink of that cup with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Isn't that wonderful? So when we partake of communion, we are not only remembering what Christ did on the cross, we are looking ahead to the day when we will partake with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's just so beautiful. I am so looking forward to that day. But according to Jewish history, after the covenant was agreed upon uh, by the bride and groom, uh, it was sealed by drinking of a common cup. Um, then the groom would leave his bride and he would go back to his father's house to prepare for her a place. And before he left, he would present her with a gift as sort of a uh, down payment of what was coming. Well, before Jesus left his disciples, he said to them, I must go away, but I will send the Holy Spirit. And Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter one, if uh, we have been sealed, he says, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee or the down payment of our future inheritance. What a promise, what a promise from the word of God. So after the bridegroom presented his bride with a gift or down payment, he would then leave. He would go back to his father's house to prepare and build on to the father's house, a room for his bride there at the father's house. But John 14 says it this way. These are the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions, or another translation says, many rooms. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And in that Jewish culture of that day, it was actually the father who oversaw all the wedding plans and all the wedding preparations. If you were to ask the bridegroom, when are you getting married? He would say this, only my father knows. Again, Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, only the father in heaven. Again, in Jewish culture, the wedding preparations would take about a year, sometimes two years. And so while the bridegroom was away making preparation, the bride was to keep herself ready and prepared at all times because she did not know when the bridegroom would come back for her. And many times the bridegroom would come at night. So they had to make sure that they had plenty of oil in their lamps to keep their lamps burning since it was a possibility that he would come at night. And the bridegroom's attendant would go before him as the bridegroom is coming to uh, fetch his bride away. The bridegroom's attendant would go ahead of him crying out these words, behold, the bridegroom comes and would blow a trumpet or a shofar to tell the bride he's coming. He's coming. I wish tonight that I had a little bit more time because I would love to talk about how I believe, and I haven't heard this talked about a lot, but how I believe uh, the rapture and the second coming will correlate with the Feast of Trumpets and Tabernacles. And um, the Feast of Tabernacles and Trumpets are always in the fall of the year. And I personally believe the rapture, the coming of the Lord. And again, I'm not setting dates. Uh, Jesus said we won't know the day or the hour, but he makes it clear that we can know the season uh, of his coming. Um, so I, I would love to talk about how these events, uh, I believe, will correlate with the Feast of Trumpets and Tabernacles. But that's a whole teaching uh, within itself. But Paul says it this way again, 1 Thessalonians, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and notice this, and with the trumpet call of God. 
Oh, I hope you're seeing this tonight. I hope you're seeing this. The bridegroom would come, snatch his bride away in the night, get his bride, take her to the place that he had prepared for her. And they would be shut away and they would be hidden in the bridal chamber for seven days while the marriage was finally then completely consummated. It's interesting to me uh, as we think about uh, Jewish tradition and history when it, when it came to Jewish weddings, it's interesting that uh, while tribulation is happening on the earth for seven years, we are going to be shut away with Christ in heavenly places with the bridegroom for those seven years. And Revelation 19 says this, let us be glad and let us rejoice for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And it's interesting that the ministry of Jesus began with a wedding in Cana and it will culminate with a wedding in heaven. And so I just want to encourage you tonight with everything that is happening in the world right now, we don't have to uh, be in fear or dread. We really can live with a hope and an expectancy because we know what is ahead. For those who are not rapture ready, it's time to get prepared. It's time for us as believers to talk to our loved ones, our friends, our family members, and make sure that they are prepared because I believe that Jesus is coming very soon. So tonight, thank you so much for your time. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it has brought a little bit of clarity um, to a few. You have been such a blessing to me during this difficult season. Um, you have been such a blessing to me personally and to uh, Healing Touch Ministries, to this ministry. Uh, you'll just never know. You'll just never know um, what a blessing you have been. And so, God willing, I hope we uh, will have another opportunity maybe to talk more about more of these prophetic events. I, I'd love to talk to you more about the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign of Christ. But I want to end just real quickly with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your people tonight. Lord, what precious people they are. Lord, I pray, God, in, in the midst of this pandemic, when just so much sickness and illness is, is taking place, God, I pray for good health. I pray, Lord, that they will live in health and no sickness. God, I pray during this time when People are suffering. The economy is suffering. People are losing their jobs. God, I pray for abundant provision to be theirs. Lord, I pray that in this hour that their faith would not fail. I pray, God, that they would be encouraged, not fearful, but encouraged as we see prophetic events that are taking place and being fulfilled right now. God, let their faith be encouraged. And Lord, I pray Hide us, Lord, in the cross. Cover us and hide us, Lord, underneath that blood-stained banner of the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, over your people tonight that no weapon formed against them will prosper. God, I pray if there's one that is watching this live stream who is not ready for your soon return, I pray, God, tonight they would make the decision to make you, Lord, of their life. I pray, Lord, that they would repent of their sin, turn away from their sin, and give you permission to become Lord over their life, that they would serve you, Lord. I pray, if there's one watching that's not ready, I pray tonight, God, that they would be rapture ready. God, I pray tonight that you would fortify our faith because, Lord, even before the rapture, God, no doubt, Difficult days are here and difficult days are coming. So, Lord, I pray that you would fortify our faith in this hour. 
And Lord, I pray all these things in the name of God's Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Friends, be encouraged tonight. Be encouraged. He is coming soon. God bless. Thanks for letting me share this time with you tonight. Bye-bye.